I read this book, How to Change Your Mind, mm -hmm. is a treatise on psychedelics, the history, mm -hmm. the benefits. Then I was having trouble. You know, somebody come up to me and they'd ask me, they go, um, you served in the Vietnam War, didn't you? I would start crying. Yeah, wow. I couldn't handle it. The longer the time went on, the worse it got for me. When I read in there that you can handle that that way, I said, I want to try this. After that, I was a different guy. I was like I was bef before the war, for sure, mm. and also the way I should have been as a kid. Yeah. And I felt good. I felt so, I mean, I felt lighter. I felt better. Yeah. I felt more, you know, more relieved, you know, like everything was okay. And, um, you know, and that was, that, that was psychedelics. And, you know, the one thing I will tell you, psychedelics gave me my life back. I actually think that's interesting what you just said, Bob. You were, we were talking about guys, girls being tough. And I said, yeah, we have to be, but guys do too. And if there's one thing about your life that you've been is tough, whether it's from your childhood, being in the Marines, being injured, uh, dealing with sort of like the emotional side of your childhood later in life, building businesses, selling, losing lots of money, building another business. And as you said before, like, no business is ever easy to dominate and make extremely successful no matter what you've done before. So where does that, where does it come from? Where does that, where does the strength, where does the clarity in what you want and that drive come from? Well, I think part of it comes from maybe a lot of it, if not all of it, comes from growing up with absolutely nothing. And, um, you know, that old saying, you know, if you ever think you're uh, too thin or you have too much money, you've never been fat or broke. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, I mean, you know, being, uh, being dead broke uh, is a big driver for when you finally get uh, an idea of what to do to be successful, work hard at it. And then plus, uh, beyond that, I had the training the Marine Corps gave me, which did nothing but help me. And as a matter of fact, um, everything I've ever accomplished, I owe to the Marine Corps. Hmm. They turned me around, Danica. But you're a billionaire now. You have money. But you're still working on growing businesses. I mean, when you sold Parsons Technologies for, how much did it sell for? 60? 64 million. 64 million? And then GoDaddy sold billions? For, well, I sold for $2.3 billion and kept 29% of it. I'm not good at math, but that's a lot. And then you go and start, you buy a golf club, and now you have Scottsdale National, and you have PXG um, golf clubs and balls. Like, you don't have, you didn't have to work a single day after you sold Parsons Technologies. Well, you see, I, I believe we don't wear out, we rust. And I think the moment somebody is done working and they're just going to take it easy, I mean, the days are really numbered. And uh, me, mm. I like keeping busy. I like, I like uh, being on the line. I, have, I like having a significant amount at risk. And I mean, that's just been me all the time. Mm. You know, people have asked me, they said, you know, when am I gonna, gonna retire? You know, I'm 73 years old now. Right. And I said, well, I'm gonna make the decision after I'm cremated. <laughs> so the answer is really never. I agree. Like, I think that the quickest way to deteriorate, the quickest way to lose passion in life and joy is when you don't have purpose anymore. It's when you don't have something to do. So you had mentioned about like being on the line and that risk. And so I not only think about the big risk of being in, in business and, you know, the Parsons Technology selling and then getting down to your last sort of like five or six million with GoDaddy and or being in the Marines. Like, is risk the actual thing that really keeps you going? Because, I mean, even PXG is a big risk. I mean, this is a this is, a, this is a, a company that's competing against ones that have been around forever and do it really well. So, like, wh is it the risk? Do you think that's the top driving factor for you well, to keep going? Well, that's certainly part of it. You know, I mean, if, if there's not the risk there, and if it was easy, I mean, what's the point? I mean, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe you'd uh, you knock it out of the park every time, but so would everybody else. 
which we, which means nobody would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think uh, you know having a you know a big degree of difficulty, you know, makes it intriguing, mm -hmm. to say the least. Mm. I'm curious because I heard you say nothing worries you. So do you think that because nothing really worries you that you're able to take those risks? Like how do you, how do the how do you reconcile risk because it and and actually feeling that when you also don't really worry about anything? Like how well, do those go together? Only one thing worries me. You want to know what it is? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you. What? I promise I won't go all psychoanalyzing on you and ask too much about your childhood. No, that's, you know, that's Dan, usually where people don't want to go with me. Danica, I'm only teasing, but it was too easy. And why uh, do I do it? You know, I, yeah. it, it just it just is, uh, makes it, uh, you, you know, for lack of a better word, fun. Mm. I mean, it's a reason to get up in the morning and, and you know, if you got enough on the line, you know, you got to get up in the morning. Totally. I mean, you know, sleeping in late, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a very very good point. When you have a lot of employees and you have a lot on the line and you've spent a lot of money and you've put a lot of time into it, you've uh, you've kind of earned yourself the job. One hundred percent. Yeah, you know, there's another old saying. You know, don't be good at anything you don't want to do. And uh, of course, you know, I love doing this, and you know, in some ways, I'm good at it. You're really good at it. It's important to me that the supplements I take are the highest quality, and that's why for two years I've been drinking AG1. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 is researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionalists with decades of experience in their respective fields. So many people have asked me if AG1 is actually the real deal, and trust me, there's a reason why I've been drinking it every morning for so long. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert-leading scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. I know I can trust what's in every single scoop of AG1 because of this meticulous process they go through. Taking care of my health shouldn't be complicated, and AG1 simplifies this by covering my nutritional bases and setting myself up for success in just 60 seconds. AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for efficacy and quality, and I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut health. I partnered with AG1 for so long because they make such high-quality products that I genuinely look forward to drinking every single morning, first thing in the morning. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D plus K2 and Five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription at drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. Check it out. You've also said, I've heard you say that in your life you've had a lot of coincidences. Do you remember saying that? Oh, yeah. And so tell me about some that have been the most life-changing coincidences. Well, I've had big coincidences. The first is how I passed the fifth grade. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was, I was in the fifth grade. I had this nun, Sister Brenda. And, uh, you know, I was never on the right side of her. I stayed <laughs> after school maybe every day, but maybe five. Oh, my gosh. And uh, so it, when the day comes where she hands out report cards, she handed out, like, um, my God, everybody's except for me, this guy Frankie, and this guy Anthony. And she said... You three stay here while I take the class out around the building to meet, you know, meet their parents. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, holy shit, we failed. And I was thinking my father was waiting to pick me up. And I was thinking there is no way I'm going to tell him I failed. So when she left, I got up and left. Didn't say anything to Frankie and Anthony. And I ran all the way around the building. And, and um, so the one thing I knew about her, she was a very lazy nun, you know. <laughs> She, she wouldn't take the class all the way down to where the, where the parents were. She would break off where the convent was. Mm. And I was banking when she'd do that, mm. right? And uh, at the convent, she didn't go into the convent, but she went back to, you know, crucify the unholy threesome. And so I got in the, in the back of that line and went across the street. And my dad is already looking at my brother's report card. 
And he goes, where's your report card? Mm. And I told him, I said, dad, sister didn't give me one, mm. which actually she hadn't. True. And then he, then he said to me, he goes, what do you mean she didn't give you one? And this is when I told a fib, I said, dad, this year, if you passed, you didn't get a report card. <laughs> and he's standing, now keep in mind, he's a total gambler. He's holding the race in form, got a cigarette going. And he's looking at my brother's report card. And he's looking at me like he heard a strange noise. He goes, you, you know, you, you, didn't get a, you didn't get a, if you didn't get a report card, you passed. I said, yeah, dad, that's right. And so he goes, takes a drag and a cigarette. He goes, all right, push. Get in the Let's car. Go. <laughs> so anyhow, I got home. Same thing with my mother. I told my mother. She's going, I never heard of such a thing. I said, Mom, call sister. Oh, my God. And, of course, she never did. But the school never called all summer long. So were you afraid you were going to get held back? Well, no. I knew I was getting held back. Okay. You know, so, uh, so I, I'm all summer long, I'm thinking about it, trying to figure out how in the world I'm going to tell my parents when they find out I failed. Right. So I never told any, any of my buddies, because I knew if I did, it'd be everywhere in about two days. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, uh, I, 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 I took in on the first day of school. I ride to school and uh, get in the schoolyard and I get in line with the sixth graders. And Frankie and Anthony are over with the fifth graders, Sister Brenda's class still, and they're going, I'm going. They're up. with the fifth and graders because they got held back too. Exactly. You're over there with the sixth graders. Where I'm not supposed to be, and she, they're going, I'm going. <laughs> right? So the, all the class, the bell rings, all the classes go in, you know, the kindergartners, first grade, second grade, you know, fifth grade with Frankie and Anthony, and then the sixth grade, I go in in the back of the line, and then on that year with Sister St. Thomas, she pulls me out of line, and her nose is like about not even an inch from mine. And she's going, Sister Brenda told me what you did. She told me um, you failed and you didn't wait for her to come back. Uh, you put yourself up so she didn't know what to do. That's exactly her, or her words. And then she there's magic words, so she passed you. That's a story. And that's how, that's how I passed the fifth grade. Oh my God. Now, what the a coincidence that possible. was. Now, I, I didn't tell my mother. I kept it a secret until I came back from Vietnam. And when I told my mother, my mother, I mean, she's old school, she goes, that is such a sin. You know, and I said, okay, mom, yeah, but so years later, after the GoDaddy deal, when I made the Forbes list, I called my mother and said, mom, I made the Forbes list. She goes, what's that? I said, you know, it's a list of the richest people in the country. And she goes, that's nice. And I said, Mom, I know guys that passed the fifth grade that are not on that list. Damn right. And she goes, that doesn't make it right. <laughs> I said, okay, Mom. I don't know what that says about your I said, mom. I said, of course. So anyhow, that's the first one. Stress is a common factor that affects everyone in today's fast-paced world leading to various issues. What if the answer to better stress response is in a key ingredient? I'm talking about magnesium. Actually, I'm specifically talking about magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers. This one-of-a-kind product is designed to reverse low levels of magnesium, which could be leading to a multitude of health problems. What sets magnesium breakthrough apart is its ability to support healthy levels of stress hormones like cortisol, a better balanced stress response in your nervous and hormonal systems, and a healthy production of GABA, the relaxing neurotransmitter leading to a more peaceful and better flow state. That's why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough from Bioptimizers. It's the only organic full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium for stress resilience and better sleep all in one bottle. Simply go to bioptimizers.com slash pretty intense using promo code pretty intense. There are always amazing gifts with purchase. Go now to bioptimizers.com slash pretty intense to get your magnesium breakthrough and find out this month's gift with purchase. The, the, the second uh, coincidence, I um, had gotten wounded in, in uh, Vietnam and I went to the hospital in, in uh, Japan mm. and mm -hmm. I got orders 
in the Marine Corps, in the Army, Navy, and Air Force, if you were wounded once, you could opt out of combat. Marine Corps is three times, of course. So they, they I heal up. They send me, send me back, and um, I go into a casualty company because my wounds weren't healed. Mm -hmm. you know, a couple of days go by, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, you know, months maybe, and then I was all healed up. I went to the doctor there, the surgeon. I said, Doc, I'm ready to go back. And he said, uh, you know, you don't have to. I'll keep you here for the, for the rest of your tour if you want. Mm -hmm. I said, Doc, I'm ready to go back. Mm -hmm. And so he said, all right, you know, so he put my orders through. My orders come through, and at the same time, the Navy had lost my payroll records. You know, they never, never got to me in, on, um, in Japan, and they had never got to me on Okinawa, so I never got the chance to do anything. Hmm. And then my payroll records showed up, and they said, all right, tomorrow morning, you leave for Vietnam, right? You go back to your unit. And by the way, your payroll records showed up, and they handed me about $800. And um, I mean, they must might as well handed me two million dollars. So they said, uh, "Go out tonight, enjoy yourself, be back at midnight." And I said, "Sure, okay." So I go off base, whoop it up, and at about three in the morning, I'm walking down the street looking for something to do. The rain's coming down sideways, and there's this guy walking back the other way. Now, my first night in the bush, I saved this guy's life. His name was Larry, Larry Blackwell. Wow. Uh, we had a guy with us that was hurt. I mean, he was hurt horrifically. I mean, he had, he had his, uh, I mean, just to be a little graphic, he had his arm blown off, wow. side of his head gone. Mm. Uh, I mean, he was perforated, bleeding like crazy, part mm. of his leg mangled. And um, so a lot of the guys there, they're just, they're just, you know, like me, you know, you know, they hadn't been there that long. Yeah. And uh, so he, they started, uh, you know, they got sick and were in the shock. And so the helicopter, the medevac, comes in to pick this guy up. His name was Irmo Hunt. And it was going to land on Larry Blackwell. And I seen it. And I, I never tighten up under pressure. I just don't. Yeah. And I seen it. I ran. I started pushing him, pushing him, pushing him. We hit a rice paddy dike, went into this nasty, foul-ass water. And the mm. chopper missed us both. Mm. Uh, for sure, I saved him. Mm. And um, so, this is the guy I run into. And see, like a couple weeks after that, his squad was ambushed, and we were told he was killed. Oh, my God. So, I, I run into him. He said, "Yes, yeah, my, it's my. Um, uh, that was my third. My my my, my third Major. Purple Heart." Oh. So I didn't have to go back. So I'm in intelligence now. And, um, you know, he goes, you saved my life. I owe you one. And I said, oh, well, thanks, Larry. I said, but, you know, I'm, I'm on my way back. And he said, look, there is a job that just opened for a courier in our, in our group. Then, and I can get you that job. Um, because once I tell the gunnery sergeant, who's a good friend of mine, you saved my life, you're in. Wow. And I said, okay. And, you know, and he says, when, when do you go back? I said, seven o'clock tomorrow morning. And he said, man, I don't know if I can do it that soon. And I said, well, brother, it doesn't matter. You know, so I shook hands with him, said goodbye. And off he went. I went back to base, immediately got arrested for, for being AWOL. Late, right? Because you were supposed to be back at midnight? Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right. And, and finally, you know, they, you know, they cut me a break because they knew I was going back to Vietnam the next day. Mm -hmm. So... At 7 a.m., I fall out with the hangover from Be Jesus Hell, <laughs> all right? And um, the uh, troop handler said, Parsons, I got orders here stationing you on Okinawa. He got it done. Wow. So I saved his life and he saved mine. No now, the coincidence was, I mean, it was about 100 things. If the Navy hadn't lost my payroll records, sure. if I hadn't broken them, um, curfew, right? right? And if he hadn't happened to be walking up the street at the same time, right. you know, on and on and on and on, but yet it all happened that way, exactly that way. Yeah. And that's why I never went back to the bush. Huh. And Which, so I was a courier. I flew back and forth to Vietnam a number of times. You know, I've seen rocket attacks and motor attacks, but it's nothing like being in the bush. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's the second that's, coincidence. That's incredible. The third coincidence was 
when I was uh, in 1975, I was 25 years old, and I was a CPA with um, uh, Commercial Credit Leasing Corp. And so they sent me to Redwood City, and I was in Baltimore to look at this deal and schedule the assets. He wanted to buy another leasing company. Mm -hmm. When I was done, I had 12 hours to kill. So I stopped by the Stanford campus, and I went to the bookstore, and I just so happened to buy a book on programming in the basic computer language. So I went to the airport, and I read a big portion of the book. And I, between then, waiting for the plane and the flight back to Baltimore, I wrote my first program or two. And just like that? Yeah. And, and the coincidence was, the big coincidence was, we just happened to be owned by control data. And in my office, there was this terminal that ran the basic computer language. Hmm. And so I was able to work with that hmm. and uh, really learn it. Hmm. And then when uh, first Apple came out, I bought that. And uh, unlike most people that would buy a computer, I didn't buy any software. If I wanted to, to do something, I wrote the code. And um, so, and then when the IBM came out, sold the Apple, bought the IBM, studied the internals, learned it all, started programming in another computer language, Pascal, and that's how I started parts of technology. But the, the coincidence was just being, you know, having that layover yeah. and, and uh, going to- um, Bookstore. Yeah, and, th and then there's about six or seven more, but I mean, it was just, I was just really, really lucky. Wow. And you remember and you notice. I think that's actually rare. I don't think that everybody has the um, sight to be able to see how scenarios unfolded for them that are so coincidental, so unique, so valuable. People just think it's life happening. But it really shows that you've had an, a, a really valuable view on life. Well, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you why I'm so lucky. Now, you can believe us or not, but I think I have a guardian angel mm -hmm. that, that looks after me. Yeah. And um, I think the guardian angel, if it's a he, she, or it, depending on the pronouns, pronouns you want to use, I think is about exhausted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know. Mine too. You know, when the Lord takes me, you know, <laughs> he, she, or it gets to go on R&R. &R. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you, so I was going to get to psychedelics a little later, but it makes me have to ask a little questions about this. Your experience with having PTSD and psychedelics and your ability to really come home, as you say, from, from war, we'll talk about that in a second, but, but as far as the guardian angels, do you feel like you have a new view or way of seeing that, th that as you said it? Like, did you see anything in your experiences that would explain why you might have a guardian angel or what that might be about? Well, I never shook hands with my angel. If you're talking about it, I, I <laughs> no. just, I just uh, uh, believe, um, believe, you know, the angel's there. Yeah. And then, you know, once in a while, I have a parking spot open up that shouldn't, and yeah. I just got to think, you know, I'm just a lucky guy. And positive though, do you think you're going to find the parking spot? Usually. Exactly. Yeah. I do the same thing. There I drive go. up and I'm like, there's going to be pole position for me here, and you pull up, and there it is most of the time. I think it's like it, it. I think we can create our reality a little bit more than we realize. Yeah, you know, I mean, other things. I ride motorcycles, right? I've been I've been hit by a car three times. Motorcycle. I've been hit by a motorcycle once, and um, twice I did it. You know, I did it all by myself, mm -hmm. or th or three times I did it all by myself, mm -hmm. and I never really got seriously hurt. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I, I think that was incredibly lucky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now you're one of the biggest Harley dealers in the country, right? Yeah, Harleys, and I think we own a Ducatis. total of seven other dealerships okay. that most of them are multi-brand, some are full, you know, everything. Yeah. Well, you know, just deals. We all like to do deals. I want to know more about business. I've obviously observed a lot. Um, 
probably going to be my biggest regret will be not changing the name of my wine to what you recommended many years ago and changing my approach. Um, it's probably why it's still not very lucrative for me. <laughs> but Always time to change the name. <laughs> but let's talk about business because you are incredible at business. And one of the first things I remember you saying was that like when the market is down, you advertise more, more marketing. And if anything that stands out to me, especially because I was part of it, is your marketing mind. So um, can you outline for people what the most important elements are to having a successful business or what do you need to look for? Well, what you need is, first of all, you need a purpose. You need a reason, the right reason why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if your reason is to make money, you're dead in the water. If your reason is to make a difference, uh, you have an excellent chance of uh, being successful. Mm. Because the things that, what I've learned over time, the things you have to do to make a business successful doesn't really dovetail with what is taught in business school. You know, if you do what, what you is mean? taught in business school, um, you're gonna go broke every time. Wow. Because what you have to do, you have to be uber you know, concerned about you know, your employees and, and, and they're, they, them being uh, uh, very excited and enthusiastic about whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's paramount. Mm. And then, you know, once they're, they're uh, uh, you know, very enthusiastic, that comes across to your customers. Yeah. And then what else do we know about enthusiasm? It's contagious. Mm. And that, you know, when, when that really starts to roll, that's, I call that tipping. Is that why the GoDaddy holiday parties were so cool? Yeah, uh-huh. Because people got so excited about those. That was like the outing of the year for yeah. me, too. Yeah. Was yeah. that part of it? I mean, is that, that part that, of like building was, the culture? That was part of it, you know. Um, we, you know, I, I kind of did that with my, my companies, you know, now uh, before um, COVID and COVID kind of derailed us. So I haven't done it for a while, mm. but I need to get back to that. I mean, these were like 5,000 people at least. So it was, they were always usually, usually they were held inside of Chase Field downtown. Like so. They had a baseball the stadium. The entire baseball stadium was covered with people. And it was, you always had the most amazing bands. I mean, you had like Pitbull, uh, Kesha, Snoop Dogg, Kid Rock, like Jewel singing in the national anthem one year. Like it, you, you guys always had the best acts, and then you gave away so much stuff. I mean, the part that I remember being a part of was going on stage with you and pulling names out of a fishbowl, and it was like every name that got pulled out was like, 10,000 for every name you pull, get going. And it was always like, <laughs> hurry up, pull them faster. And uh, then it was like 5,000, and, and you just kept giving people money. You would give people things without the ability to, ha without having to pay taxes on them later. You were just... You were clearing so much for people, and people got so excited, and it was truly like a magical, magical event. Well, the reason they didn't have to pay taxes is because I paid the taxes for them. I know, exactly, yeah. but that's what I'm saying. Like you didn't, Even if you gave somebody something, they didn't have to worry about anything after that. You made sure that the gift was clear, like it was a total clear gift, and yeah, it was like... Yeah, exactly. It was, it was truly remarkable events. Yeah, they were incredible. You know, I had the media come to me a couple times, and this was, this was during the uh, recession. I, I forget which year, but the country was in recession. Yeah. And uh, they said to me, you know, don't you feel bad, you know, having this here when you have so many people uh, that are not going to get a bonus mm -hmm. and, and uh, maybe they're getting laid off and this, that, and the other thing, or they're out of work? And I said, absolutely not. I said, you know, this thing will probably cost me $10 million. I said, the easiest thing in the world for me to be would, would be to put it in my pocket and not say a word. Mm. I said, but, mm. I said, if I spend it and spend it here, they're going to spend the money in the local area, yeah. as are all the vendors or most of them, and, um, and that's going to, going to pick up the local economy. Mm, that's so true. What do you think that, uh, you know, I feel like there's, you know, Whoever's in, whoever's the president, and whatever um, laws are passed, and changing the tax laws and various different things, 
and I have some of my own opinions about it, but what, what, what do you think drives the success of an economy the most? Like what kind of framework? Do you think it's high taxes? Do you think it's low taxes? Like what ends up spilling over into from, from upper class to middle and lower class to making a community Well, successful? you know, the one thing I can honestly tell you is that's way above my pay grade. You yeah, know, but you're a part, like you're yeah, a big well, fish. You're yeah, a yeah, big, well, big fish. Well, well here's, the, here's the deal. I don't know. All right. I would think, I would think it's putting more money into the economy and having the economy, you know, start to start to heat up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's one of the things. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see our Federal Reserve has got a pretty good handle on that. And, uh, you know, during the, you know, the last recession at, in uh, 2008, well, one of the reasons why it didn't get worse than it did is put a lot of money, you know, put a lot of money into the economy. Mm -hmm. And there was a mm -hmm. time when, you know, they weren't smart enough to do that. And that was way back when, when, you know, you had like the, uh, the depression of 1929, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, when, when the economy took a tank mm -hmm. and they didn't do anything like that. I mean, you know, they were they were smart. I mean, the Democrats, you know, it was were in charge, and they they bailed out uh, Chrysler, and uh, you know, General Motors and Ford were just hanging on the edge, and they, you know, and they kept everything going. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, having a smart government in that regards is is a very important thing. Now, um, you know, you're not going to hear me say smart government too many times, <laughs> yeah. but uh, because, you know, you know, most of the time governments are mm -hmm. just governments and, you know, our, our nuclear scientists build nuclear reactors. They don't go into government. Do you get into politics at all? Like, I mean, you're an influential person. You have a lot of resources. You have a lot of money. Is it something that you get into at all? Do you, do you care? You know, I don't. I don't at all. I don't get into national politics. Um, you know, I made a few donations in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, I gave Mitt Romney a million. You know, he sent me two nice cufflinks. Nice. And uh, I mean, they were they were they were gold plated, not gold. And they said, gold -plated. and they said Mitt. And and I still have them. He said and, his uh, name on it. You know, I when 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 a national when you know one of the parties asked me for a donation. I said, look, I, I'll give you these. You know, they're worth five hundred thousand dollars each. It reminds me of your uh, the, the conversation we were having about tomatoes and how you donated money to a local farming group that, uh, and you just said you wanted tomatoes, and they gave you three slices for a million dollars. Yeah, well, all I wanted was a tomato sandwich, and they and they came in and they made me a tomato sandwich and white bread with mayonnaise, which was exactly what I asked for. And uh, I gave them the million dollars so they could, they could, you know, build their garden and so forth. And um, I told them, I said, you know, if anybody, you know, doubts, you know, the, you know, it's, uh, you know, whether the viability of what you're doing, just tell them you just sold a guy a tomato sandwich for a million dollars. Exactly. What is it that kills a business? I mean, there's so many that don't make it. I mean, we're living in the era of startups. So... Like, what is the quickest way for a business to, to die? And how long do you hold out in your experience for something to make a turn? The thing that absolutely kills a business is loss of focus and uh, poor and shabby accounting. I mean, there's so many things. Yeah. You know, ba basically just, you know, not having a handle on things. Loss of enthusiasm where nobody believes in it anymore. Mm -hmm. Quality problems you know, which will, which will just kill it. Yeah. Uh, so, so many things like that do. I mean, when I was a kid, I had a lemonade stand and I, I made uh, uh, lemonade using, using vinegar instead of lemon juice. How'd that go? Well, no, it didn't go well. <laughs> you know, a matter no of fact- No return customers? Well, as a matter of fact, this, <laughs> I was about eight years old. This is 1958 in Baltimore, East Baltimore. And that's back when the insurance guys would, would walk a debit route. I mean, they would collect the weekly premiums. And so this guy, Mr. Hill, he was walking by and he seen my lemonade stand. I just set it up. And he goes, <laughs> he, says, he says, oh man, this is exactly what I need. Now, when I, when I made this lemonade, I didn't know my mother in the lemon bottle kept vinegar. And so, so I made the, made this lemonade, and it and I you know I never tasted lemonade much, but I kept thinking, 
well, maybe this is the way it's supposed to taste. Uh, <laughs> I just kept adding vinegar, oh, sugar, no. and sugar in it, mixed it up, and then I, I set the picture out there. It said lemonade, five cents. <laughs> It looked good. So he gives me a dime and told me to keep the change. And then he takes a, one of the little Dixie cups full of, full of lemonade and then knocks the whole thing back. <laughs> and I remember he, he, his eyes bulged straight out of his head. And then he spit, spit it into the street. And he says, kid, that's the worst fucking lemonade I've ever tasted in my life. And then he just stomped away. Well, that was the first sign that it was going to be a very problematic day. <laughs> <gasps> yeah, but you sold vinegar lemonade. It's like selling <laughs> ice, chocolate ice cream to a woman in white gloves kind of scenario. Well, it, it, it was worse. It but, was it, worse. but anyhow, I, I had about three or four victims. And after that, word was spread out. And when my mother came back and I told her what I did, she, you know, she said, well, come on, let me, let's fix it right. And I did. Uh, Nobody would touch it. <laughs> uh, but probably good, because who knows, then you might have gone down the lemonade route and well, food, and that was just not going to be your bread and butter. Thank goodness it moved into technology. Okay, we talked about Parsons technology a little bit, but it would, like, I'd be totally remiss if we didn't talk about GoDaddy. Yeah, you would. Yeah. Do you have a favorite commercial? I have about eight of them, and it's every one you ever did. Yeah, your commercials were exceptional mm. and um, you always kept them classy <laughs> in spite of um, you know sometimes you know us getting losing a little focus well I was always dressed really covered I always had the leather jacket on and the black pants you and the did, heels so did. I was always and, really and, and covered. You kept you kept the, the verbiage pretty <laughs> pretty nice I mean you did a, a class job <laughs> for us and you kept us on the you know on an even keel mm. and um, you know, I liked I liked every single one of them, every single one of them. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were lucky, Danica. We were lucky to link mm -hmm. up with you. And uh, one of the you talk about coincidences. That's one of the best things that ever happened to me, business-wise. Mm -hmm. I um I read the chapter. Um, I just got the book, but I was scanning through, and I read a couple of chapters here and there. And of course, one of them I had to read was the GoDaddy Girl chapter, and um, reading that you were in Alaska with some buddies and that's kind of how so do you want to tell the story that's about how i found you yeah <laughs> yeah i was i was i was in alaska out in the middle of nowhere camping out up by the arctic circle <laughs> and uh, there's two guys that live up there and uh, uh are totally i mean you know they, they really don't have much media and so forth and i i asked them both i said do you know who danica patrick is I go, oh, yeah, she's a race car driver. She led the Indy 500. Both of them knew it. And I said, if these guys know you, yeah. everybody does. And yeah. everybody did. Yeah. And, th and that was the impetus to, to follow through and reach out to you and to see if, um, you know, we, we, we had a shot at that. And it just so happened, you know, you left um, uh, Letterman Ray Hall or Ray Hall yep. Letterman. I mm -hmm. forget what it's called. Yep. And then, you know, you, you switched over to Andretti Green, mm -hmm. and that's the time we struck that deal. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we stayed partners for years. I mean, it was over a decade. I mean, if you add them all up, even more. One of the things in the Chapter 2 was saying how when you went home, you, you know, you, you kind of looked at the media and marketing and things that I had done, and you saw that I had done FHM so that you, you knew I'd be kind of up, up for the deal, up for the advertising and the creative direction. And, you know, you had, you had had a really big commercial for the Super Bowl with Candace uh, that was uh, a blockbuster and very controver controversial. Uh, but you saw that and you were like, all right, let's do it because obviously I would be willing to do some things that are a little different than others. And I always said that I only ever did anything that I was comfortable with. And I did turn down some commercials. Some you, of them, some, you, you turned down many things. A couple things were a little too far for me. Um, but I was always really honest with you, and you were always very respectful of, of that. You know, one of the things that I got asked a lot about a lot was use, using my sexuality to my advantage. And I never had a problem with it. And I always said that there, we all are multifaceted people. And so thank God that I'm able to show that side and also the tough side and the aggressive and the, you know, I have all these different aspects of me. So 
Like, what's your view? I don't know how many, you know, I don't really know how you feel about it, but I'm curious. Like, women using their sexuality or men using it, like, what is your stance on all that stuff? You know, and you obviously I, used it in I, such a productive I, way. Here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. Women's sexuality has attracted men since the beginning of time. Yeah. And why, and, and it's one of the things that, that is, um, both for men and for women, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. And, and to all of a sudden want, want to change it, you know, for whatever, whatever reason, mm -hmm. to me is nuts. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not part of that camp. Why do people have a problem with it then? Well, you got to ask them. Yeah, I mean, you're right. You're right. You know, you know, you know, the cancel culture, they wake up in the morning looking for something to be offended by. Right. And, um, you know, usually they're, you know, they find something. Yeah. And, um, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely have a problem in society right now with not being able to say or do nearly anything. It's easier to say nothing, do nothing than it is to... Um, put something forward that's either funny or interesting or controversial, and we live in such a sensitive society. Do you think that everything would go, do you think you'd be able to do all the same things that we did in the past and that you've done in the past with marketing and advertising now? You know what, I, I think I could, but I'd take more of a beating. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember when there was a, the Elliot Spencer prostitute scandal. You remember that? Yeah, somewhat, right? somewhat. Okay. Well, the only person that was the true victim of all that was me. And, and the reason it was is I had a guy call me and he said, hey, Bob, he goes, he's from maybe the Wall Street Journal or something like that. He goes, you know, um, oh, yes, Spitzer and this scandal, you know, the woman involved, her name is Miss Kristen. And I, and I said, okay. And he goes, I have, are you talking to her about becoming a GoDaddy girl? <laughs> and I said, I oh, had a great idea. <laughs> and, and no, I said, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> I said, but thinking about it, I said, she's very attractive. Mm -hmm. You know, she's certainly in the news and controversial. Mm -hmm. And I said, then um, you should probably get a lot of connections. <laughs> and I said, um, hmm. And then he publishes this article. But Bob Parson at GoDaddy is considering hiring Kristen so and so for GoDaddy girl, and then of course I got all these letters and emails. Oh, you know, you pig, you 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 animal, you this, you that, and I said, I didn't hire the prostitute. He did. <laughs> all I did was answer the media's questions. But that's the way it goes. Media is savage you know they can build you up they can break you down but i do th i do think we're in a, a an, an interesting era where more of that bullshit is being clear to people do you watch the news do you pay attention to the news I, you know i watch and read the news every day yeah and um you know i see very little bit of that you know i see some things some things being mentioned you know you want a good book to read yeah um it's called the cancer the cancel culture Dictionary by a uh, Jimmy uh, Falala or Falala. Mm. I don't know how to pronounce his name, mm. but anyhow, I think he's on Fox. Uh, sometimes he's got a show. It is drop dead funny and absolutely spot on, and it, uh, it just that steps through. Steps it's a, through. Is it funny? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Steps through it. You know they talk about. You know they talk. He talks one time. I think he talks about. You know Bill Cosby and. Um, uh, two other comedians, uh, and uh, he says, you know, I've never seen these guys perform together. They're all pretty good, uh, but one thing's for sure, if they do, those two other comedians aren't going to let Bill Ten bar. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. That's fun. Somebody needs to poke fun at it. Man, I think the last line of defense against all of this crap is comedians. Well, that's the way we get by everything. Right. And we put it into perspective. Right. Is a little bit of humor. Just like and, our commercials, right? It just yeah. like, can't you just have like a little bit of sense of humor and understand marketing? And so many people lack that. Well, you know, in our lives, we all have an opportunity to be 
you know, offended and, 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 and you know, on, on edge about something, or, or we can just ignore it and chuckle at it and be happy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in the be happy crowd. Mm. Have you always been there? Always. Even when I was a little kid hmm. and I was going through all that stuff with my mother's insanity. And you, you, know? and you were alone a lot. Right? Yeah, I mean, alone a lot, yeah. You know, the one little little story that'll tell you the, everything about my life is I had to teach myself to tie my shoes. Mm -hmm. And I had nobody to teach me, That's and crazy. nobody did. And, wow. uh, you know, I started by tying knots, and then I had to stuff this string in the side of my shoes, and the knots were a bugger to undo, and, you know, things like that. And, uh, and then eventually I, I got it right. I got, you know, where I had two bows where you pull the string and it came undone. But the way I do it is so unconventional. I was going to say, you, it must not be the normal way then. I, I, I have people look at me, tie my shoes, and I go, who the hell showed you how to do that? And I said, nobody. I figured it out myself. And I go, looks it. I have to see this. I want to see. Somebody got a shoe that we can tie? <laughs> this, is, this, this is a self-taught. You invented. You invented tying your shoes. Well, you know, I bet there's other people that do it this way, but uh, I figured it out for myself. Another thing you figured out for yourself was how to, I, I want to talk about psychedelics now, because that was one of the things that over the last few years we've kind of connected on and we've talked about, because that's been part of my life as well, in a, in a very medicinal way for the most part. A little recreational, but none of that was part of my life, obviously, while I raced, not at all. Tell me about how you arrived at the option of taking psychedelics okay. and seeing if that would improve okay. your life. First of all, I had never taken anything like that in my life. As far as I was concerned, you took LSD, you wanted to jump off a building. You know, I mean, that's all we ever heard, right? That's the propaganda. Yeah, I mean, I didn't think that was true, but I mean, I just never had the impetus to try it. Mm -hmm. I read this book, this wonderful book, mm -hmm. by who, a man who's now a dear friend of mine, Michael mm -hmm. Pollan. Mm -hmm. And Michael's book, How to Change Your Mind, mm -hmm. is a treatise on psychedelics, the history, mm -hmm. what they do, mm -hmm. Uh, how they, uh, their benefits. They ended up making know. it into a documentary for those who yeah. don't want to read it. They, yeah. they put it on. Yeah, there's I think a documentary maybe it's on Netflix. On, on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Just yep. go to Netflix yep. and, and Google, and, 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 and not Google, but enter in the search field how to change your mind. Yep. And it's like four or five episodes. Yep. I've, I've literally watched it eight times. Yeah, I've watched it too. Yeah. It goes through each of them. It goes through, you know, psilocybin, mescaline, and LSD, yeah. and it kind of articulates and, and, the and nature of them. And is the least intimidating guy you'll ever meet. He's yeah. just a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> soul. So anyhow, his book, his book is, is the same exact way. Mm -hmm. So after I read his book, and I mean, I was, I was having trouble. It's, this, this was... Um, in 2018, I would have, you know, somebody come up to me when I was at, at you know, the golf club I belonged to, and they'd ask me, they'd go, um, you served in the Vietnam War, didn't you? I would start crying. Yeah, wow. I mean, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the longer the time went on, the worse it got for me, wow. you know? And uh, so when I read in there that you can handle that, that way, and um, I, uh, I, I showed my wife, my remarkable wife, Renee, and uh, you know Renee. Oh yeah, I love her. Yeah, and so she, uh, I told her, I said, I want to try this, and she had me hooked up within uh, yeah. two weeks. She said, go get her. And then, so I meet these, these two guides, at an undisclosed location in Hawaii, <laughs> um, by Kona. <laughs> <laughs> at my head. <laughs> and uh, so they, the treatment was four days. Yeah. You know, the first day they gave me ayahuasca, mm -hmm. and that's made from a South American vine. Mm -hmm. And it is um, not the nicest thing to drink, is it? I love coffee. Do you love coffee? Yeah. I think it tastes a little like coffee, but look, after the I did it two nights in a row, and after the first night when I was so sick from the experience, or purging as they say, the next night I wasn't as excited to take my drink, but, um, but it, it's not, it's kind of thick, it's bitter, um, it's not delicious. I'll tell delicious. you what, if you think that tastes like coffee, <laughs> 
You need to take a real hard look at where you get your coffee. <laughs> I drink it black. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, it is. It is like, oh man. It's a little rough. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyhow, at the same time I'm taking this, they're asking me questions about what's bothering me and mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about and mm -hmm. this and that. And we talk about the war and a lot of this was from my childhood. You know, we all grew up tough, but you know, growing up the way I did and then having Vietnam as the topper on it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It just, um, you know, over a while it was tough to deal with. Yeah. And uh, so after, after ayahuasca, the next, and, and I, and I, and I um, hallucinated, hallucinated a little bit. I would love for you to go a little bit into each one of them and explain it because I think part of the skepticism that people have is sort of, as you said, you take LSD, you jump off a bridge. People don't know what it's like. And so the unknown is a little bit scary. Well, so they're all, they're all, just they're all remarkably like. non-toxic. Right. Um, the, uh, the, uh, ayahuasca that I, <laughs> the ayahuasca that I took you know, I never really had like these huge, huge um, uh, hallucinations yeah. except once. And I was I was looking at the ceiling and I would see these lights moving all over the place. Your eyes and, were open. And, and that was that 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 was ayahuasca. Were your eyes open? Uh, yeah. Did you close your eyes with ayahuasca much? Uh, no, I never did. Oh. A guy kept trying to get me to do it. He yes, said, exactly. You, you have your, to. Why don't you close your eyes and lie down? I said, yes. No, I feel great the way I am. No. <laughs> it's because it opens up that third eye, that sort of like inner vision, and there's a whole world in there. Yeah. Like there's a universe in there. When your eyes are open, you're kind of anchored to this reality, but the eyes closed is where the real... Well, anyhow, yeah. the next day, <laughs> the next day... Did you was... get sick from ayahuasca? No, okay. not, not, I've never purged from anything. Okay. Um, maybe that's been from being a Marine. Probably. Tough as hell. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Hey, so the second day was was uh, psilocybin. Yeah. And so the guy says to me, he goes, Bob, I made this tea, and it's I got this pot of this psilocybin type tea, and I made it really strong. It holds three cups. You're only going to need one cup. Then I go, I drank all three cups, and I ate the tea bags. Hell yeah. Yeah. That'll yeah, get baby. you there. That'll and, get you there. Oh, I was. I was. Did he tell I, you how many grams that was? Didn't matter. Hero's <laughs> dose. It was a hero's dose. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, needless to say, I was on a roof. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, I mean, I've seen, I've seen, I mean, it's all over the place. <laughs> and um, a lot of tears. I mean, a lot of tears. Mm. A lot of tears. I mean, it's a mm. painful thing to relive all that, all that shit, you mm. know. And um, the next day, it was a um, day off. Mm. So Renee and I went and, and we went and um, played golf. We played nine holes. And when I was out there, it was like the trees knew I was there. <laughs> and I knew they knew. And, and Did the, you talk the, to them? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the grass <laughs> on the green knew I was there. And the grass would say to me like, Bobby, Put it here, and I wouldn't go right in a cup. I, I've never put it like that. I since. actually made a joke the other day. I'm like, I should take some mushrooms and golf and see if that helps me out, because Lord knows I need a little help with my game. <laughs> well, maybe maybe that'll do it. And then the last day, it was LSD. Uh. But what happened was, after that, I was a different guy. I was like I was before before the war for sure mm. and also the way I should have been as a kid yeah. and um, oh my god people when I went back to work people would say what employees would say what happened to Bob he's so different you know he um, you know he's, he's so nice he he's you know he, he's, he's so complimentary he doesn't get upset this that and the other thing and I mean and I felt good. I felt so, I mean, I felt lighter. I felt better. Yeah. I felt more, you know, more relieved, you know, like everything was okay. And, um, you know, and that was, that, that was psychedelics. And, you know, the one thing I will tell you, psychedelics gave me my life back. Mm -hmm. And um, since then, I've been a spokesperson for them whenever I'm asked. 
-hmm. And um, I've been asked many times to invest in it, mm -hmm. and I have resisted that mm -hmm. totally, even though I've been a number of wonderful opportunities, I don't invest in it. And the reason I don't is I believe by not investing in it, I'm more believable. And what I have to say, I have more credibility. And um, I asked you, you know, about that too. I was like, hey, I'd love to start a mushroom business. You want to do that, Bob? And you're like, nope, I'm going to stay out of that. But yet you have donated something like 12 to $15 million for the you know, legalization of different psychedelics, including MDMA, which I had Rick Doblin in here uh, not too long ago interviewing him and had realized that you guys knew each other and you've donated a lot of money for yeah, I knew him. that yeah, and mission I know, that's been I, going I, on for 40 years for him. You know, I know Rick. I feel, I feel you know, consider Rick a friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, good dude. Yeah, good dude. Yeah, Super nice. and uh, he's been working on this since time immemorial. Yeah, 40 years he's been working yeah. on getting MDMA legalized yeah, for and, and why therapeutic purposes. And why it's not legal now, it's, it's unbelievable. Why do you think it is? Let's go into like, well, go, well, why I, would that be? I, I think it's because of the stigma around it when it was MDMA, no, when it was ecstasy mm -hmm. and, and, and kids were using it as a party drug mm -hmm. and being very happy mm -hmm. and just dancing around. You can't have that. Can't be that happy. No, you're not allowed Society to have that. Society that happy no, can't be no, controlled. No, you're not allowed to have that. I mean, you know, it's like... You know, marijuana, you know, I, you know, I hear that, you know, what a mistake it was to legalize marijuana. You know, show me one incident where somebody smoked or took marijuana and got violent. Right, right. It's never happened that right. I know of. But now look at alcohol. <laughs> alcohol. One of the most destructive substances there is, yet, yeah. yet legal. Yeah, well, I like... Uh, I mean, I like alcohol. It's not, it's not, it's not a, put it down too far, but... Yeah, you know, I, I, you know, I know, you know, there's, there's a comedian that says, you know, black comedian, the reason he says, he goes, if, if marijuana and that sort of thing was sold by white people, he goes, it had been, it had been illegal 20 years ago, and, and so forth. And, you know, and I, I think there's an element of truth to that. But, mm -hmm. you know, keep in mind, you know, alcohol was, um, you know, there, there was no no marijuana and stuff like that, but and, and alcohol was the only, the you know the only drug. And then you know with the, um, you know I, I, I forget you know the abolitionists, you know it became illegal. Prohibition. For, for yeah, for yeah. a number of years, yeah. and then it uh, became legal again. NASCAR helped that out, you know, bootlegging. That's where NASCAR was born. Yeah, it I was. That, I guess they they were they they needed to outrun the cops, so they'd soup their car up so that they could outrun them. And I guess that sort of parlayed and into And they get NASCAR. together and race. Yeah, <laughs> drink and drive. So smart. Well, anyhow, do you have any alcohol in your tank? Oh, uh, yeah. At one point in time, I'm sure uh, ethanol. <laughs> back in you know, <laughs> trying to change the fuel fuel over from regular alcohol to ethanol. That can be drunk. <laughs> Why not? Um, did you have any, um, did you see anything really interesting in your, in your trips? And, 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 and it's fair to say that you continue to do some therapies after your four, four day experience. You know, one of the things I did when we were talking about the war. Uh -huh. During the experiences, right? No, during, during the book. Oh, okay. When I was working with Laura yeah. and we were on Hawaii. I, um, to really open up and, and to reach back to it because I, I have a habit of dissociating and that's one of the w ways I, I, I got through the war. Sure. I've been successful in business because of that and on and on and probably things just don't bother me. I, I took mushrooms before we would, we would talk and you know, she'd record mm -hmm. you know, what I had to mm -hmm. say and you know, I started telling her about you know, you know, after I was wounded and was, was in intelligence, I, um, um, when I just had about three or four months left on my, you know, my, my tour, uh, the unit that I was in uh, was disbanded. And a lot of the guys were, were sent back to, back to Vietnam. Now, I volunteered a total of three times to go back to my unit in Vietnam 
because I just wanted to be with the guys. Mm, I, I didn't give a that. shit if I got killed or what. I wanted to be with them. They were my first real family, you know. Mm. They'd do anything for me. I'd do anything mm, for them. Goosebumps. And it was rich, you know. But uh, never got approved. You know, I was going to be sent back there, but I was going back to a random unit. I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to be with those guys, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm going through troop processing with Okinawa. And I mean, it is a cluster. I mean, it is, it is you know, it's got people everywhere and not enough people doing the processing and so mm. forth. So I went over to the, I had this young second lieutenant in charge of it and I found him. And I said, Lieutenant, you guys look like you need some help. I said, now I'm on my way back to Vietnam. I was with the intelligence unit and so forth. I said, I can do any job you have here. I said, uh, what do you say? He goes, he says, give me your, your ID card. He goes, you got the job. Oh, he shit. goes, help him out over there at that counter. <laughs> I said, done. So one of the things that I had to do is I, I helped uh, guys that were coming out of Vietnam, going home. I put them on, on flights, process mm -hmm. them that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And guys that were coming from the States and they were going to Vietnam, mm -hmm. I put them on a plane and I confirmed their units. Mm -hmm. Now, from being in intelligence, I got to know who the really hard luck units were mm -hmm. and um, uh, the ones where the guys were most likely they were... Not coming back? They were gonna either come back hurt or, or you know, in a box. And... Um, I remember how hard it was to look at these guys Send because them. they were like mm -hmm. I was, even though I was their their age, because I was just 18 when I when I went over there. Mm. So, but but they, you know, I had matured a whole lot from being over there a year, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, w I would I would see those guys, and um, you know they were like you know joking around with each other and so forth, and the ones that went to like units like Ninth Marines or certain CAG units or so forth. You know, I knew what was going to happen to them. I could hardly look at them. Well, mm. when I was telling Laura this, I literally flashed back and I was there. Mm. I mean, I could see them. I knew what I felt like. I could see myself how I was dressed. Mm. And, uh, and uh, I started crying. I don't remember ever in my life crying that hard. But mushrooms purged me of that. Yeah. And uh, now I'm able to talk about it. Now, before yeah. I couldn't even talk about yeah. it. This, the medicinal value is tremendous. Yeah. I think when the day comes when it is all legal, it's going to be a renaissance. The thing to remember is taken by themselves, the psychedelics don't do much. But the secret is the therapy does the healing. Mm. The mushroom, the psychedelics make it possible. Yeah, they open it up. It makes us more open and receptive. Mm. Truth yeah. comes through. Truth yeah. really Particularly comes through. Particularly MDMA. Yeah. I mean, you know, Rick had to tell you the third field trials, yeah. which, uh, which, which I kind of helped fund. I'm proud of that. Thank you. And... Um, I mean, it is like dramatically positive my reaction. My God, if so there, like if there was any pharmaceutical yeah. that had that 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 efficacy, proved. Scent. Yeah. Full and scent. then the other thing is, it's non toxic. Right. It's just non toxic. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that story. I, I I went back there with you. I could really feel it. And that's not a lived-in experience for me, but for you to have lived that experience and then to be able to help me to feel that and now to articulate it really shows the, the bridge created with the medicine that allowed you to be able to revisit that and to be able to purge it and to be able to um, share that experience. I think that we all go through really traumatic things in our life. Some are big T, little T, as they say, big traumas, little traumas. Um, but, the, but the mark of trauma is that you've had something happen that, that, that was an emotional reaction and it marks that point in time. And that's exactly what happened to you when you 
went to that memory, it marked, you were marked at that point in time. So that's why you went right back exactly there. Oh, I mean, boom. Yeah. 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 Psychedelics have a, a huge future in healing and, um, and uh, I look forward to that renaissance as well. Um, Bob, you've done so many amazing things in your life. Uh, you're such a generous person. You're truly the most generous person I have ever met. Um, I think it should be said how much money you give to charity, which is something like, what did I hear, a million dollars every two weeks? That's, that's, that's about it, you yeah. I mean, I watched it through the holiday parties. I watched it at, you know, Celebrity Fight Night and how much you'd give. I watched it when I had a charity item at uh, Make-A-Wish and you paid like $300,000 to go to dinner and drive, ride in a race car with me. And I was like... You could I just do that for you. <laughs> um, well, that again, so generous. That again, it was worth six hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's truly remarkable. So, you know, to wrap this up, you know, what are you most proud of, and how do you want to be remembered? Well, how do I want to be remembered? Hmm. You know, I am more than anything a blue collar guy. And I'm a lower class blue collar guy. And I'm proud of that. Um, my people are the police officer, the firefighter, the ambo driver, the mailman, the taxi cab driver. They're my people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always look up to them. You know, it's just however they, you know, they, they, they want to remember the, the, they want to remember me. They're the only ones I care about. Um, you know, that's just fine. And if they do, wonderful. And if they don't, you know what, I'll join them because nobody's going to remember them anyhow. What do you want to be remembered for? What do I want to be remembered for? Maybe writing this book, Fire in the Hole. Being a good businessman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. You know, I don't have, I, I never think about that. Yeah. Never think about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, people ask me, they go, you know, do you ever think about what you've accomplished? The answer is no, never. Mm. Why? Because that's not going to help me at all today. I know. I, I, that's I, totally I, the mark of a successful person. <laughs> I look at I look at what's, what's cooking in front of me, yeah. and then uh, and then you know what am I going to look at when I get to where I get to go? What I need to do the next day, and that's what I do. Anything on the cooker then? I mean, you got PXG cooking pretty good. Is there another one? Not at the moment. Do they just arise? Is that how it happens? Sort of mm -hmm. a passion or an interest just sort of is a seed that grows into something where you go, hey, let's just start doing this. Let's take this over. Let's buy this. Let's build a company. You Do know, they happen super organically you, and instantaneously? You know, you know I, I, th I thought about that. You know, we, we, we had a deal recently. We bought some land and we're going to build an airplane hangar hmm. for a lot of jets. Locally? In Arizona? Yeah, uh-huh. Oh. I, I never once thought I'd ever be in that business, but uh, hmm. I think uh, I'm going to learn a lot about it. Hmm. We so, should pour a drink and talk about that. So there you go. <laughs> and then, you know, I'll tell you a cool thing to be remembered for. What's that? Being your friend. Oh. You know, as I've said so many times, ditto, it's the same thing. I think this mutual respect that we've had for each other for decades has really been the most beautiful friendship and business relationship I've ever experienced. So well, happy to call you, you my there, friend. Sister. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.